Thank you, John, uh, and thanks to PCAS for the chance to be here with you all today. I'll just add as a footnote that when I first arrived at OTA, the woman who sat in the office next to mine was Marjorie Blumenthal, so you know, and you're all very lucky to have her here now. Um, uh, it's, it's just great to have this chance to talk with you about DARPA. What I thought I would do is uh, give you a little bit of background and context for the work that we're doing, share with you six brief examples of projects across our portfolio, uh, and then um, try to use most of this time for conversation. So um, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief and zip through some of the materials I have in the interest of time to get to the discussion. Uh, many of you know that our story at DARPA began actually the year before we were formed in 1957 when the Soviets launched Sputnik. Um, the U.S. response to that surprise included many things that uh, I suspect later made the Soviets regret that they had launched Sputnik. One of the things that we did in 1958 was to establish uh, the original uh, ARPA agency that became a we, we sometimes have a D and sometimes don't, but it's the same agency. It's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And if you think about the late 50s, that was a time when we had, in the post-World War II era, we had started building what is you know, really today the R and D, the federal R and D system that we have today. In the Defense Department, we had R and D activities in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force. Uh, but it, Sputnik said there was uh, that we really also needed a specific entity, a specific place whose day job was to think outside and beyond the known issues, the known opportunities that we were, we were dealing with already. Uh, and that was what DARPA, that was the reason that DARPA was created. Uh, my predecessors quickly realized that the best way to prevent technological surprise was to create a few surprises of our own, and that's been the history of the agency uh, now for nearly six decades. Uh, my partners and colleagues in the Defense Department know us as the place where the technologies for stealth and precision guidance and navigation and advanced battle networks, uh, where those technologies originated and were demonstrated, uh, the technologies that have changed how we fight. In my Silicon Valley life, I found that the technology community knows us as the place that helped uh, form the discipline of material science, lay a lot of the groundwork for what is the information technology revolution that's in full bore today. Um, and that duality of uh, mission uh, of military technologies, but also the core enabling technologies that we invest in because of their national security pr uh, promise, but which we know often historically spill over and, and can form the foundation for products and companies and often even industries because of private sector investment. That duality is something that is very much part of our history and you'll see I think as well in the work that we're doing today uh, the, the potential for that in, in the future. Now, we're a place that's very proud of our history, but I also want to underscore that nothing I mentioned happened uh, single-handedly because of DARPA. We are 200 government employees in an office building in Arlington, Virginia. Um, uh, we are part of uh, a vast and complex and intricate technology ecosystem in DOD, in the Defense Department. We're also part of the larger national R&D ecosystem um, you know, that you all represent from all the different perspectives that you have. Um, and uh, the only way that we can get our job done is, in fact, to be able to tap that incredible, uh, vibrant, robust uh, ecosystem that, that we are part of. Within those communities, though, DARPA has one particular job, and that is to make the pivotal early investments that change what's possible so that we can take these big strides forward in capability. That, that's really where we live and breathe. So that mission of breakthrough technologies for national security has not changed in uh, all these decades at DARPA, but of course the world in which we operate has changed and changed and changed, and uh, so today it's important for us to be clear about the context that shapes the investments that we're making for the next generation. Um, uh, let me mention to you sort of the major parameters that shape that context. One, you know, in many ways we live in, a, our job at DARPA is informed by the challenges of national security and then inspired by what is possible tech, in, in terms of technology. So let me try to give you a little bit of a sense on both sides um, about the context that we're living in today. 
The national security world that we live in today is one um, that is uh, characterized, I would say, by its diversity and by the pace at which it is changing. My first tour at DARPA was, started in 1986. When I arrived, we were in the Cold War, and we were very sure it was going to last forever. We were completely wrong about that, fortunately. Um, but that was a time when one monolithic adversary uh, focused our attention and drove uh, all the thinking about how we made our investments. I returned to DARPA in a period when we were winding down from two uh, ground wars, a focus on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. And what I quickly realized as I came back into the national security environment is that today and for the decades that we see out ahead, in fact, our nation is going to have to deal with uh, the questions of national security challenges from nation states, the questions about w what is Russia exactly trying to do in Ukraine, uh, where will China's growth and its ambitions and its changing role in the world, where will that take it, what is Iran going to do, what is North Korea going to do, those are still major questions. At the same time, the chronic national security threat and the challenge that we deal with literally every day is about the nexus of terrorism and criminal activity, cross-border criminal activity, and then often linkages among those communities back to nation states. It's this shape-shifting, diffuse, networked threat. Uh, a, a set of linkages that have existed throughout history but now are empowered uh, by global technology. So that is the breadth of the national security challenge that we have to keep in mind. And then on the technology side, in fact, the world is also quite different because uh, much of our R&D ecosystem in the U.S., in the national security world in particular, was built in a time when we could make U.S. technology investments in confidence that we would have a 20 to 40 year period of proprietary advantage. And of course, that's not at all the world that we live in today. Uh, to, it, this year, we will have seven billion subscriptions to mobile uh, phone services in a world of seven billion human beings. A mere three billion people have access to the internet, um, uh, their ability to access cyberspace, uh, their ability from a few click strokes to get access to uh, amazingly powerful microelectronics components. Uh, th those are things that have been incredibly good for uh, the human race and for elevating living standards around the world, but they also pose very important national security, a new kind of uh, national security challenge uh, for those of us who live in our world. So that global technology context is a very different and, and also critical part of our context at DARPA. So that's the backdrop. Let me try to give you a sense of some of the things that we're doing in the agency today. And just to put it into sort of three major categories, I'll give you examples in each of these. Uh, a good portion, probably about half of our investment at DARPA today, is in the business of rethinking complex military systems. Um, in, in one domain after another, what we see is that our very complex, very, very powerful, very capable military systems are reaching a point of diminishing returns. We've saturated our capabilities in many regards. And I'll give you a couple of examples, but the theme here that you will hear is the need to get onto a new curve, typically characterized by new architectures for thinking about how we're going to generate the military effects that we need to be able to do for the next generation. Approaches that break a methodology that is about big, monolithic, costly, slow, hard to upgrade platforms. That's really how we do business today. It's just not going to cut it for the next generation. One major theme, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. Uh, in terms of uh, the information realm, uh, when I was at DARPA 20 years ago, when you talked to people in the military, they sort of knew something might be happening with computing and communications, but it didn't really seem central to their business of national security or military capabilities. Today, when I talk to senior leaders, uh, a couple of days ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with General Odierno, who's chief of staff of the Army, and he, ta he started by talking about, he said, when I went into Iraq, I had no data, and by the time I left, I had too much data, and I was drowning in it. And information 
information is now integrally part of the national security enterprise at all levels. Uh, I, I think we are in the middle of a long and very, very productive time in uh, the information revolution. Um, today, the challenges that we're facing have a different character than the ones I saw a few decades ago at DARPA. Today, the challenges are about dealing with information at massive scale, and I'll give you a couple of examples of things that we're doing there. Finally, and always, one of our jobs at DARPA is to constantly be surveying the research horizons and to be looking for the places in basic research where, where the pot is really bubbling. Uh, much of that research is, is simply going to be wonderful science. Uh, what we're looking for is the places where we see the seeds of technological surprise. And that happens in a number of areas. Uh, there's work that we're doing at, in um, the advances in cold atom physics and new areas of chemistry and new, uh, new areas of math and algorithmic approaches. But one that I really want to highlight today uh, is uh, the area where biology is intersecting with the physical sciences and engineering and with information technology, uh, an area in which DARPA has been working at a modest level over uh, actually probably about 20 years now, but where we recently formed a new office, the Biological Technologies Office, uh, to really seize this opportunity uh, to start shaping biology, not just as a science, a, a discipline of science, but really as a, as a core technology. And in fact, you've just been talking, Eric, your comments a minute ago, the work uh, that was being discussed about uh, the Brain Initiative are terrific examples. I'll share with you the work that we're doing uh, in some of those areas as well. Um, let me start with complex military systems. Uh, let me start by giving you one example of uh, how we're trying to rethink the architectures for these complex systems. On the left is a depiction of uh, how we currently do one of the things that needs to be done in a complex military operation, an air operation in this case. That little uh, rectangle on the top right, on the top left, uh, is an adversary radar system. The aircraft that you see uh, on the left-hand side, its job is to jam that radar so that the the adversary can't see us coming in to do whatever it is that we need to do. Uh, and the way that we do that job today is uh, about a hundred million dollar system. Uh, it's a, a, a very uh, expensive aircraft with an expensive electronic warfare suite on it, uh, essentially sending out a very powerful uh, radio signal that jams that receiver. Now to deliver that much energy uh, on the ground where that adversary radar is requires this massive beam. By the time that beam comes to ground, it covers an area about the size of the beltway around Washington, D.C. It's carpet jamming everything that's in the way, including us when we try to operate in that arena. Um, we really can only go after one radar at a time. And when the adversary tries to figure out where that jamming signal is coming from, it's not that hard to find because it's this big monolithic source. Um, over time, the adversary is going to get better. That's what, that's what happens in this world. And if uh, over time their ability to push us out farther uh, increases, then what we have to do is go through typically you know, a 10 or 15 year block upgrade cycle back to the drawing board, a, a huge amount of time and cost to do an upgrade. The question we're asking at DARPA today uh, is can we break that model? Um, if you look inside that aircraft, inside that jammer, what you will find over many generations is advances in microelectronics capability that are really pretty amazing. Um, better power amplifiers, better use of digital silicon technology, more, more uh, powerful antennas. What we've done with all those advances in the past is just cram more and more capability onto this one monolithic platform. Today we're saying, let's see how we can use those advances in a radically new architecture. And one, one of our projects today is going to try to demonstrate the thing that you see on the right, where that jamming, instead of coming from one monolithic source, is actually coming from a collection of cooperating micro jammers. Uh, because uh, the energy that they need to deliver on target is actually squared as, their, as the, the electromagnetic energy is aligned with high precision, and that's one of the hard challenges. But because of the way the energy is being delivered, uh, this actually goes as one over n squared. So each of those six small transmitters only needs to be one thirty-sixth the size of the thing that's on the left-hand side, an amazing scale opportunity there. 
They, they're able to do precision jamming. They can go after multiple types of different radars. Uh, when the adversary tries to see where that signal is coming from, it's not coming from one place. It's coming from many places. It's going to be much harder to find. Should they take one of our small UAVs out, uh, we still have the ability to deliver quite a lot of capability on, on target. And when the adversary increases standoff, now instead of using six units, we use nine. And we can do that instantaneously, not in 15 years. Uh, enormous advantages, but uh, if, if, uh, if you think the technology is hard here, and it is because none of this is trivial, this is the kind of thing that is going to give our partners in the Air Force and the Navy tremendous headaches because it completely changes how they're going to operate, and I, I think that speaks to what, what kinds of barriers these technologies face in the future. But when you see how much more capable this future picture is uh, and the fact that I think it will allow us to drop costs and actually build build systems in volume rather than just building PowerPoints for the future, uh, I think it, I, my hope is that it will be compelling enough that we can actually start moving to these new kinds of architectures. That's one example. Uh, many, many, many other examples in terms of distributed battle management, distrib distributed communications, distributed radar systems, distributed position navigation and timing rather than relying on GPS. Uh, in a different domain in space, uh, a very similar story. If you think about what's happening on orbit over the last few decades, space is becoming nimble, agile, real time uh, through commercial activity, through the activities of other nation states as they enter the space domain, um, not in the 50s and 60s, but with the technologies of today. Meanwhile, national security space has gotten slower and slower and slower and more and more costly. Uh, today, when we want to put up a major new national security capability on orbit, it, it, typically it is a multi-billion dollar proposition in development, multi-billion dollars to get that then launched. And even worse than the cost is the amount of time. It's, it, for, if today we know we want to get something on orbit, it's typically a couple of years before we can get it on orbit. And when we go, when we launch, we only have a very small number of fixed launch sites to access space from. That is just not going to cut it in this new real-time environment that, that, that we're in. And the work that we're doing at DARPA is to try to demonstrate some radical changes in many elements of that. I'll just highlight the launch piece uh, on the upper right here. Um, uh, it, the, the revolution, again, in microelectronics has allowed us to build very powerful small satellites, and we're seeing that in the commercial, in the civilian, and in the defense sectors. But again, if we don't break the launch part of that, then we're not really going to start getting the, the kind of flexibility and the real-time capabilities that, we're work, that we, we need. One of our programs in this area, a couple of programs in this area, aim to uh, change that dramatically. One of those, uh, our LASA program, is essentially a technology that would allow us to, uh, opt from an F-15, from any airfield in the world, uh, be able to put a 100-pound satellite into a low Earth orbit. Uh, for a million dollars, that's groundbreaking. But even more groundbreaking is the notion that you could do that on 24-hour call-up. And, and that's, I think that's a great example of uh, the kind of disruption that this, this environment really calls for. Let me shift gears and talk a little bit about the information domain. Uh, one of the problems that we deal with in information technology today is that all of us in, in our work lives and our personal lives, but also in the national security sector, we are so critically dependent on information and our information systems. Uh, but these are not high trust environments today, and the challenges of cybersecurity uh, are something that we are grappling with. Uh, many, many people today, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector, uh, are the way we deal with cybersecurity today is patch and pray. We find vulnerabilities, uh, we manually address them, and uh, the only way we know how to scale our cybersecurity capabilities today is to hire more people as fast as we can and have them plug holes as fast as they can. Uh, that's, it's a smart strategy today because we don't have an alternative. Our job at DARPA is to try to create an alternative for the future, and our core objective here is to come up with cybersecurity approaches that fundamentally get ahead of the scale at which information is exploding and with it the vulnerabilities that are also exploding. Uh, one uh, technology program uh, in our cybersecurity portfolio is the Cyber Grand Challenge. Uh, this program, uh, if, uh, do folks here know about DEF CON, major uh, hacker conference that happens once 
once a year in Las Vegas at DEF CON is a, uh, a well-known challenge, Capture the Flag, where teams of hackers compete uh, to try to keep their systems up and to avert attacks and attack each other uh, and, and to win by um, controlling the, uh, their systems in this sort of fierce competition in an isolated cyber environment. It's a perfect uh, example of what we're trying to do manually today, uh, but it's also uh, a great competition that allows us to, to see the best in human reasoning about the cyber environment and cybersecurity. Uh, the Cyber Grand Challenge aims to get us on a path to being able to do that kind of cybersecurity in an automated fashion. And our analog here was when we started building a league of their own for computers to play chess. Back when we started, computers were really bad at playing chess and humans always whooped them. But when they got a league of they, their own and they started competing against each other, they got pretty good to the point that they could beat humans and uh, that's now what routinely happens. Cyber Grand Challenge is going to create a capture the flag environment specifically for automated uh, competitors. Uh, and we've thrown this open to the whole world. We've gotten about 80 uh, uh, people signed up. There's still more to come from every part of the world. We've gotten uh, hackers, uh, amazing academics, people from companies. Uh, we're going to give them a chance uh, to play capture the flag and start building our automated systems, which at least have now, I think, the hope once we start down that path uh, of getting faster than, you know, the typing speed of the best, fastest human hackers to, to, uh, to deal with the automated uh, scaling threats that we're facing. That's one problem in, this, in the information domain is trust. The other issue has to do with how we get value out of this deluge of bits that we all live in. Uh, and again, a number of programs that are going on at DARPA. I want to emphasize, I want to just share with you one uh, new program called Memex. Uh, this was a program that uh, is setting out to create uh, a different approach to doing a different kind of web search uh, today, uh, uh, very different than what happens with commercial search engines. Uh, the, the program manager here, Chris White, when he started Memex, he, uh, he, wanted, he did a little seedling project to see if there was really a, a there there. And so he started working with uh, some of our colleagues in the law enforcement community who were working on human trafficking. What he found was that the way that they explore uh, the online space of uh, sex services ads was pretty much the way you or I search on the web, this sort of single-threaded walk through this vast, seemingly infinite space. Uh, it's a very difficult way to try to piece together a story about how networks might be hidden in that, in that uh, online uh, space. Uh, our team built uh, a tool that allows us to look across a set of those public ads, and again, uh, privacy is always an issue when we're talking about data. The, here we're talking about the most public information there is. It's advertising information. Uh, the team put together the capability to look for thing, signals in those websites, phone numbers as an example, and you, you can see the cluster map on the left where some phone numbers seem to show up over and over again. Uh, they pull together uh, uh, a picture of uh, all those clusters looking to see where the phone numbers were that, that were most uh, frequently uh, popping up in one ad after another. They took from that cluster map, again, all of this is being done just on public information. We took 600 phone numbers from that uh, analysis, threw it over the fence to our law enforcement uh, colleagues, who then compared it to their carefully developed uh, database that had been built after you know, many years of arduous work. They were surprised to find that from those 600 phone numbers we discovered, uh, those numbers tied to over 400 known criminal violations, uh, which was interesting enough. But then they found that among those phone numbers were links to 30 fund transfers in the regions around North Korea. And that, that tool, which was actually just a little seedling project, became now has become a, a very, very valuable tool that they are using uh, to start being able to focus their attention uh, onto these places where uh, they can chase leads for um, potentially uh, running down these kinds of uh, human trafficking networks that span the world and actually also then tie back you know, back to our world of national security, I think a great example of how national security uh, has, has uh, linkages now into the law enforcement world. So uh, one example, but uh, I think a very interesting uh, 
national security and law enforcement uh, contrast to what's going on in, in the private sector. Let me finish uh, with two examples from the world of biology. This is a perfect follow-on to Eric's comments about what are go what's going on with Ebola. Uh, it, the way we are going to deal with infectious disease uh, is always going to be first and foremost diagnosing what's going on and tracing it. Uh, secondly, trying to find a way to build a fire break and then provide longer lasting immunity to broader populations. Uh, and the things that you talked about, Eric, I think are you know exactly what we need to be doing in each of these areas. The question that we're asking at DARPA is can we look for techniques that will allow us not just to shrink diagnostics from a lab scale to a desktop, uh, but and not just do uh, vaccines more quickly, but can we find some fundamental advances that would allow us to completely collapse that response time uh, and get us to the point where when the next H1N1 comes along or the next Ebola comes along, that uh, very, very rapidly we can go from knowing what the new disease is to being able to nip it in the bud. And uh, th this is a program that's been underway for a few years, um, but uh, in some of the work that we were doing, uh, we quickly realized that it could be applicable in the Ebola work uh, that's underway today that Eric was talking about. So today we have some of our distributed diagnostics that are on the ground in West Africa. Instead of a machine that plugs into a wall, these are small battery-operated diagnostics tools that allow for a very specific Ebola diagnosis, uh, a step in the direction that we, you know, ultimately we want to get to the paper strip test. I think we'll get there, but today we can do something that's already a big advance. In terms of uh, the transfer of uh, antibody response and uh, generating new vaccines. The key uh, theme in the work that we're doing today is looking for ways to develop uh, nucleic acid uh, therapies and um, uh, prophylaxis. Uh, today, when we want to provide protection, we either deliver a weakened vaccine to trigger the, uh, our own immune system, or we transfer the antibodies from a survivor. That's some of the work that's been going on with Ebola today. Our question is, can we understand not what those complex molecules are, but can we understand the nucleic acid codes for those and, and send that message, deliver that message to the human being, and let the, let the patient's cells actually generate the antibodies or the antigens to stimulate a, a, a vaccine-type response. Uh, one of the major advantages here would be the ability to provide immediate protection as opposed to the delay from vaccines. The second major advantage would be the manufacturing scale-up that would allow us to deliver uh, not just onesie twosie doses as we are able to do with tr antibody transfer, not just uh, the kinds of volumes that are possible when you have to grow uh, vaccines in living organisms, but the, the kinds of therapies that could actually scale to uh, thousands and then millions, if needed, of doses. Uh, so we're we're uh, we're trying to accelerate that work now to have an additional component in our response to Ebola, a backup to some of the other things that are going on. Whatever happens with Ebola, the, to me the critical thing is that we have a platform that allows us to be ready for the next disease because the next one will come. Uh, and then just to finish, I think uh, we've talked before with this group about the work that DARPA is doing in neurotechnologies. Uh, this is part of the President's Brain Initiative. Uh, the, day, the work today that we're doing in revolutionizing prosthetics is wrapping up. There, the key thing that we were able to demonstrate was the direct neural signaling from the motor cortex being used in real time uh, to control a prosthetic limb. Uh, that kind of closed loop uh, real time control, I think, was a major breakthrough. It's something we're able now to do with our first few uh, human volunteers in clinical trials. Uh, the work that we're doing in memory recovery uh, is a new program called uh, Restoring Active Memory. This work then moves not just from the motor cortex, but is now starting to look at multiple regions of the brain. And the problem that we're starting with here is the question of trying to restore task memory, a particular kind of memory impairment that is common in PTSD and in traumatic brain injury. Uh, but again, uh, a, a, I think a much more complex job than the kinds of things that we did in the revolutionizing prosthetics program. The subnets program uh, continues that trajectory by looking for uh, the kinds of information from across, again, multiple regions of the brain that we hope will start giving us insight into neuropsychiatric disease. Uh, and, and I think, you know, across that work, I hope you, you see a theme, which is 
A very natural starting point for us has been the restoration of function as we think about the challenges that our wounded warriors face. As we're doing this work, we are opening uh, very uh, intriguing doors into possible futures. Uh, and I think, you know, very much uh, to the comments, Jim, that you that you uh, got got going about uh, in the last discussion about brain function. Uh, this is probably a very good time to talk a little bit about the ethical questions that arise. Um, and I, I think a lot of the good points that were made before are very much what we have in mind at DARPA. I want to say that while it's, it, you know, when you start talking about what the human brain is going to be capable of, th th that is uh, a very natural place to ask these kinds of questions about how society will use these technologies. But in fact, I find that those questions come up over and over again in our work at DARPA, whether it is big data and privacy issues issues, whether it is the uh, safety and security implications of advanced synthetic biology. Uh, I, I think it is part and parcel of our mission to focus on breakthrough technologies. If we're doing our job, we are going to be stumbling into these new areas and, and uh, having to deal with these new challenges. Uh, our approach at DARPA has uh, two parts that I'll just mention. Number one is this actually is our job, and I think it's important that we not shy away simply because of these, these challenging questions. We need to understand these questions and these technologies for our country first. So that's part of it. But with it comes, I believe, a responsibility to raise those ethics issues uh, and to convene that dialogue. In the case of the neurotechnologies work, we have uh, a group of experts uh, uh, whom we draw on uh, to have conversations as we're shaping our programs, but perhaps more importantly, also to talk with our performer community. I think it is important that the graduate student who is working on a DARPA contract in one of these areas knows that when they come to a program review that we'll be talking about the societal implications of these technologies as we're investing in them. Um, I, we don't, we're not going to come up with the answers, but I do think part of our role is to raise those issues. Uh, let me just finish uh, with a quick word about what it takes to do all of this. One of the things that it takes is resources. Uh, on the left, you, just a diagram, 135 billion is the world that you all know very, very well. DARPA is about a quarter of the Defense Department science and technology investment that's been steady, uh, reasonably steady over the last many years. The degradation in our budget uh, over the last few years is a reflection of the broader degradation of budgets as, as DOD budgets have come down in the post-war era strongly exacerbated by sequestration in fiscal 13. Uh, the cumulative effects of those small cuts uh, was about a decrease in tw of 20 percent in our budget from 09 to 13. Uh, I was very pleased to see it stabilized in 14, and we hope to continue to get a little bit of a restoration in fiscal 15 with the help of Congress. We'll see how good we do on that. Um, but, uh, you know, DARPA does not, we've never aspired to be a large agency. I think it's, it's much more important that we have stability here. The other part that's uh, critical that doesn't show up on a chart is, is continuing to have the support and confidence in the uh, Pentagon and in the White House on both sides of the aisle uh, in Congress. And I think, um, I, you know, there I think we, we are in a very good place. I think that's equally important for us uh, if we're to keep this, uh, this particular kind of organization uh, going. So I'll stop with that and let, uh, throw it open for comments and discussion. Well, thank you very much for that uh, extraordinary presentation. The first flag up is Susan Graham. I'm not going to stand up. Um, you said at the beginning of your talk that uh, one of the things DARPA has always done is to create disruptive technologies, and that's one of the ways that we've uh, kept our edge. Um, and then a little later when you were talking about the Cyber Grand Challenge, uh, you talked about a global competition. Yep. Um, now, we've always had a tension between what's ours and what, what's the world's, um, but the, the globalization has increased a great deal since you first went to uh, DARPA, and the speed at which uh, information is com communicated around the world has increased. So how do you and DARPA think about how we maintain our technological advantage? 
Yeah, that, that is, um, that's a very complex question that we grapple with in a couple of ways. Uh, the, the work at DARPA is a portfolio of individual programs, and I, I, it, I think it's very hard to have a blanket answer because on one end of the portfolio we're doing work that is classified, and you know that one's easy, we know what we're going to do with that. On the other end of the spectrum is basic research that if we isolate it, it will wither and die because it needs to be informed by, participate in, draw from, uh, this vibrant global community. Um, and, and so it, the answer to your question is something that we try to think through for each program. It's something that we talk with each of our program managers about. Uh, one thing, I, DARPA does do work uh, in other countries. Uh, it's a very small portion of our budget. And in fact, one of the things I've been urging my program managers to do, I, I think there's a tendency, in, especially in an era where there's great scrutiny and budget pressure, uh, people tend to think about overseas travel as this luxury, but I am pushing my people to get, they're, they're very good at getting out of their offices and going out into the national technology community. That's important and good, we have to keep doing that. They also need to be understanding what's going on in the rest of the world to be smart about it and then often to try to draw from it. And I like the things that we're doing overseas, but I, I think um, I, that's an area where I think we still have more work to do. Tim Gates. Thank you, John, and thank you for the scintillating brief. Um, you referred back to my earlier comments about ethics and uh, as one moves into these new technological realms, the, new, the challenges keep coming. And so there's a certain tension of first between uh, proprietary or confidentiality on the one hand and on the other hand uh, getting really good advice about uh, negotiating the ethical minefields that are out there. So my question, uh, there's sort of two questions I have. One is, is in your mind or in some of your colleagues' mind, is there an architecture or a programmatic structure that allows you to systematically address this question as it keeps apparently arising in different areas? That's question number one. And then uh, question number two is, what is, the, what is the role of partnership with other parts of the U.S. Uh, federal establishment in trying to address some of these issues? Right. Uh, the, the practical way that we deal with these, the ethical issues that come up and the societal implications itch, issues. Let me, let me make an important distinction. Number one is uh, the, the, the ethics, the safety, and the security of the work that we actually fund. And then number two is what if it actually works? How, how will society grapple with how, what choices we want to make about how we use it? DARPA isn't going to control that. I want to make sure we start the conversation for that part. But back to the, the concrete part of what we do. The, the structures are in place so that, so that when we do anything that involves human use or animal use, I mean, that, that's not that complicated. The rules and regulations are clear. The institutions know how to function. And, and I think it's just critical that, and everyone in my organization knows how to deal with that. The much more subtle and complex question is how do we start the conversation now as we're starting to see what technologies might be capable of so that others, it's almost never going to be DARPA, others are going to be making choices about how we use that. Uh, and I, I have, we've talked a lot about how best to do this in the agency and concluded that uh, again, because of the diverse nature of our portfolio, I don't think there's a blanket recipe. Uh, but in fact, what happens is uh, as each new program is formulated, when I or my office directors or program managers start seeing that there might be very interesting societal questions that come out of that, we put our heads together and we figure out what to do about it. Sometimes what we do is simply have a workshop and, and air a number of uh, opinions in order to inform ourselves as we think about our choices. Uh, sometimes it's putting together uh, an expert panel that can be, you know, sort of run alongside with us and help inform our communities in the way that I mentioned. Um, but I, I, I don't really know, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to form fit it into a standard process because I think each area really is going to raise different kinds of questions. Uh, your question about working with other parts of government, on the Brain Initiative in particular, uh, the President's uh, uh, advisory group on bioethics 
uh, has been uh, actually as part of the Brain Initiative, I believe, is, is uh, working on some of these issues. We've had good discussions with them. And, uh, I, you know, th that's a great example of something that is much bigger than the little piece that DARPA is doing. Um, so I think it's important for us to have those relationships. Good. Um, Chad Merkin. Yeah, that was a fantastic presentation. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, I've been a um, yeah. big fan of DARPA for a long time and, and worked with them for quite some time. So I've, I've, I've learned a lot about the model. When I think of DARPA, I think they're the best at um, going after big ideas, disruptive technologies, and building teams. Um, but one of the things that kind of concerns me in terms of the, the recent models is that when you think about building the teams, you made a reference to graduate students coming to um, PI meetings and yeah. discussing you know, what, what they're doing. Uh, there is a, a tension in the model uh, with respect to dealing with universities and dealing with companies. Um, the commitments, the resources available with the different groups are, are vastly different. And so when you go from a three-year commitment or four-year commitment to an 18-month commitment, um, that is a huge tax on a university in terms of getting them to participate because the graduate student has a, a five-year PhD, not an 18-month yep, exactly. PhD. And so what I wonder is, is DARPA missing a lot of opportunity by kind of inadvertently pushing participation away by not addressing that particular problem? And then connected to this, if you think of the whole teaming and you take a, a technology development exercise, let's take Ebola. You go down, you connect the dots. You say, I have to have the science, the new science that allows me to do it. I have to have the new technology. I have to have the translation. And then I have to have the buyer. Yep. Um, what often falls short is the latter stage because there isn't a long-term commitment. And in the, in the business model uh, of a company is to, to make product and sell it and make money. And if you don't have a firm commitment, and you don't know there's a buyer, what happens oftentimes is the early stage is done well, but then there's a deviation. Exactly. Yeah. And then the question is, do you end up getting the bang for your buck that you're ultimately looking for? And I, I guess I'm curious yeah. what your thoughts are. On, on yeah, I think those are two great questions. Uh, this issue, uh, you know, w to do our work, uh, we work with organizations that have their own objectives, and universities are a great example. And, and I think that the tension that you highlighted is something that I have seen over many, many decades at DARPA, and I don't think we're ever done grappling with it. The fundamental issue is we're trying to get something done, and, and our time frames tend to be three to five years for a program. We often there are pieces within that. And, you know, I was a graduate student once. I remember that, that it doesn't always happen exactly on that same schedule. Um, and and I, I don't have a magic solution for that. I think the... Um, the art of how we manage our programs um, needs to accommodate the fact that, when, especially on the basic research end of our portfolio, which is where our, our, most of our university work is, um, I just I, I keep asking my program managers to come back to what is the objective, what is it you're trying to do, and often on the basic research end of that portfolio, the objective might be. Uh, so getting a deep new insight that tells us which direction we want to go with something, if that's the case, you, you, know, you have to structure programs not to be you know, six-month milestones. Um, you know, you're just, just going to irritate everyone, and you're not actually going to get there. So, so I think exactly, or you simply won't have the relationship that you need to start with. So we're, that's how we're trying to think about it. It doesn't always work very smoothly, and I think that that is a consequence of it is the flip side of the thing that I think is great about DARPA, which is we're going here, and by God, we're going to get there, right? And I, sometimes there are not very attractive consequences to that. So I'm aware of it. I don't think there's a magic solution and something we keep trying to work on. Your second question is the perennial question about how do you get from showing that something is possible to actually making it real? I Th that is my hardest problem, whether it is getting new distributed architectures into the Air Force or whether it is getting new, you know, a new therapeutic technique um, out into the world, especially. I mean, we're talking about Ebola into parts of the world where there isn't a big market that pharmaceutical companies are going to be excited about. So that, that is something that, um, that I, I, everyone who's done R&D, I think, shares this problem. It's something that we grapple with all the time. On the DOD side, I think um, we've done a much better job at DARPA, I believe, over the last couple of decades uh, in building the DOD relationships with, with, the, with the military services. 
uh, so that we know how to work with them a little bit better. It's still hard. I, I would say it's better than when I was there 20 years ago. Um, the, the vast number of different commercial markets and entities that we really need to be able to have those kinds of relationships with, that ends up being much more retail. So my people who are working infectious disease are the ones that go work with the pharmaceutical companies. And you know we're just at the Gates Foundation because they and we share this interest in getting these technologies deployed in the world. So we, we try to make common cause with them. But it's just a completely different set of conversations if it's about the next generation of some complex image architecture for, for a new semiconductor component, right? So With uh, apologies to Michael McQuaid, we have exhausted Exhausted okay. the time, we are obliged to stop uh, on time. It's noon, uh, but Arthi, thank you so much for that uh, terrific presentation. <laughs>